Okay, this is our lecture on human evolution. This is chapter 30. Uh, so just an outline of the presentation. We'll talk about the evolution of primates in general, right? Then the evolution of human-like hominins, um, evolution of the early genus Homo, and then the later genus Homo, which obviously then gets us to the current um, present-day Homo sapiens. Uh, if we, you know, talk about primates in general, right, so we're talking about the order primates to which humans are a member of, um, you can see the different groups here, right? So for simians, and so this is kind of going from simple to more complex for simians, right? So like Tarsier here, we'll talk about them a little bit more. Um, this guy, it's old world monkeys, baboons, um, apes, right? So here's this uh, picture of a chimpanzee. Uh, oh, sorry, they're not really going... Uh, it's not really going from increased uh, simple to more complex. We'll we'll look at a phylogenetic tree in a second. That'll make sense. Um, <clears throat> New world monkeys, Asian apes here, here like orangutan, and then you talk about hominins. Humans are going to fit within that group. Okay. Uh, so like I said, we'll we'll see a phylogenetic tree in, in one more slide after we talk about just some of these uh, sort of trends. So if we talk about sort of you know moving from traits that were present in you know other groups of animals um, moving towards the primates these are trends that we see in the primates right so more mobile forelimbs and hind limbs hands that can grasp flattened faced which allows for a stereoscopic vision a more you know a larger more complex brain and a, re a reduced reproductive rate okay and so let's talk about some of these uh, trends or sort of traits right um, if you talk about primates, most of them, and some, not all of them, but most of them have flat nails instead of claws, which allows them to grasp things, right? So if you think about other animals, you know, that are more simple than primates, they don't have this ability to grasp and to hold. Um, there are sensitive pads on the undersides of the fingers and the toes that allow for, um, you know, uh, increased sort of sensory information. Many of them have an opposable thumb, again, not all. Um, and basically that means that your thumb can touch all four of the other fingers, so you can try that out. Um, all right, so this is basically what we're just saying. So if you talk about these mobile limbs and these clawless, um, you know, fingers, you can freely grasp and release tree limbs, right? So if you think about most of the primates, all the primates, um, they're adapted to living in the trees, right? And so these things are going to allow them to grab on and swing through the trees and then be able to, you know, grab onto the next branch. Also, they allow primates to be able to reach, grab food, and bring it to their mouth. All right, and so if you look here, again, this is kind of showing you the evolution of the primate hand. You know, basically we just talked about in that in that last slide, but you can see here in this tree shrew, right, they have these sharp claws still. But as you sort of start moving along here, you know, towards human, right, you can see how the hand is changing, right? So in the tarsier, um, you can see that there's, there's still some claws, but they're sort of reduced, and they have these sort of suction-like pads on the fingers, which is still is going to allow them to grasp and hold on a little bit better. Monkey, you can see now those nails are shortened, um, and but they're, they're the thumb is a little bit shorter than you see here in the human, okay? All right, that next trend, and by the way, you should know all of these trends are sort of traits that you see in primates in general, right? So these are all primates in general. Something called stereoscopic vision. So it's 3D vision, and this allows for depth per perception. You can see how this would be necessary if you're trying to jump from one branch, you know, one tree branch to another. Um, if you don't have good depth perception, you're not going to be able to do that, right? Um, and some primates even have color vision, okay? So obviously this is a much more um, complex or elaborate type of vision than we've seen in, in other groups of animals. Okay, and so this is showing you here too. We, we talked about kind of the, I think I'll mention, yeah, along with this too on that first slide, it said about a flattened face. And so if you think about peripheral vision, right? Um, if, if you have this sort of protruding snout or whatever, you're not going to be able to have this peripheral vision, right? So the flattened face and the reduced snout also helps with, with vision as well. Um, and, and now if we talk about the brain, much larger, more complex. Um, if you compare, right, and so if you compare the brains from the Persimians, that, that more simple group of primates, uh, which is composed of the lemurs and the tarsiers, those um, 
their brains are more simple, not as complex as those as apes and humans. So as we move to more um, complex type of, types of animals within the primate group, you would see a much larger brain. That larger brain can process more sensory input, right? So you're able to get more information in and process that information. Um, <clears throat> And so portion of the brain that's devoted to sight is larger. Again, you have more complex um, visual information coming in. You need to have a more complex brain that's able to process that information. Um, the portion of the brain that's devoted to smell is smaller, right? Because even these more complex animals don't rely on smell as much. They're, they're relying on sight more. A portion of the brain devoted to communication is much larger than we've seen ever before, okay? And so this is allowing or sort of supporting primates to live in more social groups and to have sort of more complex interactions and and more complex types of, of thinking and we'll talk more about this as we go through um reduced reproductive rate is the other one um so you're gonna you know you have a decreased rate of reproduction one because and these you know primates are going to live longer it also takes them much longer to develop right to develop you can see this here length and gestation time allowing for forebrain development because that brain it's so much more complex, it needs more time to develop, therefore their development is much longer, right? So they're, you're not going to be able to handle multiple parts because of this, okay? Um, also with the development period or the um, early developmental period being longer, also the juvenile period of development is longer, right? So. Also the. Yeah, the juvenile period of development is, is extended, right? Because there are sort of learned behaviors that have to happen. So there's just a much more sort of longer series of events to be able to obtain these more complex social interactions and social behaviors. All right, so if we go through the sequence of primate evolution here, <clears throat> I believe that hominins to which humans and there are other species that are very closely related to humans those are believed to have first evolved around five million years ago um if we group all right sorry about that we're back here um so these are um terms that group these primates together and so obviously a lot of them the names are similar so you just have to kind of um might take a little bit of time to kind of study this and I'll show you it. it's also on the phylogenetic tree um, so if, if you're talking about the group hominins these are humans and species that are very closely related to humans um, if you group together the hominins the chimpanzees and the gorillas those are grouped as hominines then you have hominids which will include hominines all these and then also the orangutan if you say hominoids that includes all the hominids and then also the gibbon. Um, and then anthropoids are basically the hominoids, the old world monkeys, and the new world monkeys, so all of them. And so, right, if you look here, so it's basically, so we're, this is the grouping that we're just talking about. So anthropoids, right, hominoids, hominids, right, and hominines. And so you can see here humans and those that are closely related are hominins. Okay, um, these guys, the tarsiers and the, le and the lemurs, are prosimians. Okay, so again, we should know these terms here. Okay, and so they're listed here, but it might be a little bit easier to look at them this way. Okay, but again, here's our phylogenetic tree. We're, we're showing this is all the primates here, different groups of primates, right? And so again, we can see these guys down here, most simple to more complex. All right. Okay. So we're going to just talk a little bit in more detail about what types of um, species, obviously um, these are pretty much all of them are, not all of them, but most of them extinct, but what types of, how do we lead up to our current, um, the current human, the homo sapien, okay? So <clears throat> this is talking about some, a link between monkeys and hominoids. Again, right, we're talking about evolution of primates or evolution essentially of human human evolution so how did you get from you know monkeys basically all the way up to a very complex um, type of species like a human okay um, so there is a 
fossil that was found, okay, and so this proconsul is sort of this transitional link. It's believed to be this transitional link between monkeys and hominoids. Um, so it had limb proportions that suggested that it walked as a quadruped, right, as monkeys do. Um, and it was basically believed to be this ancestor of a group called the Dryopithecines. Okay, and so it was believed that hominoids aro arose from these triopithecines and that these guys came from this um, ancestor called the proconsul. Okay, well, again, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about things like this as we move along. So if you look here, this is showing you the, the skeleton of a monkey compared to this guy. So you basically can see changes, right, and differences between the monkey and the skeleton here. And so it has sort of some monkey-like features and also ape-like features. Again, this is why it's sort of believed to be this sort of transition moving from monkey to ape, and then eventually we're going to get more complex from there. And so, right, it has short forelimbs, narrow ribcage, quadruped lifestyle, all monkey-like. But then you start to see some other things that look more ape-like. So a flattened vertebral column, lack of a tail, right, um, mobile shoulder joints, and a larger brain relative to body size, okay? And so again, the reason why we're talking about this, this is a fossil that was found and that is believed to be this sort of transitional link between monkeys and apes, okay? Um, if we start to talk about these proximians that I mentioned before, if you go back to your little um, phylogenetic tree here, we're down here, okay? So these guys were the first type of primate to diverge from, from basically that common ancestor for all primates, okay? Again, most simple of these primates. All right, now let's talk more about the evolution of the hominins, okay? So again, you know, as, as, been, as I've been saying basically sort of all along in, in most of these chapters, we now with DNA data and other molecular data, really our ideas of evolution and, and, and have, have changed, right, based on that evidence in terms of where, you know, things were derived from. So, um, this is kind of what this is is meanting. So again, this this is sort of ever changing as more and more evidence comes along. Okay, uh, if we look at some, you no. Know, however, obviously we still get information from fossils, right? We, we then take those fossils and we can get DNA from those fossils, and then basically sequence, right? So we can take like a Neanderthal. We'll talk about, and I'm sure we've heard of Neanderthals before. Basically, we have the entire um, sequence of the Neanderthal. DNA, right? And so then we can compare that DNA sequence with the current human DNA sequence, um, you know, genome, and we can look for changes and look for differences and similarities. And that's how, that's changed a lot of what we know. All right. So if we look at some fossils of hominins, they they have to have, right, if you're talking about it being a hominin, it has to be able to stand erect, right, and basically walk on two feet. So you're going to see bipedalism, so you don't no, no, longer, no longer see the quadruped. Now, these, um, if you're a hominin, you're a biped, okay? And so that's what this is also mentioning here. If you're talking about the differences between humans and apes, a lot of the skeletal differences are because of being a biped versus a quadruped, okay? So if we, again, you know, look at these groups that we've, we've talked about these sort of names before, right? Here's the order primates. If we look at these different groups here, so the family, right? Hominidae, hominidae, which is hominids, and then you can have these, these subfamilies in here, okay? And so you'll break, so these hominins, we basically break up into sort of, sort of early and later uh, hominins, okay? And so we're going to talk about some of these species, um, and, and there's fossil evidence and stuff like that, so we'll talk about some of the characteristics um, that they're believed to have. And then <clears throat> if we now get into the genus Homo, right, we can talk about early Homo, right, like Homo habilis, and again, we'll talk about these guys. And then the later genus Homo, again, you're going to see, you know, a, a larger brain size, right? More, you know, culture and, and social inter interaction is, is evident in the later genus Homo. And so this is, I just mentioned Neanderthals, right? These are part of the later genus Homo, okay? So these guys are hominins, and we're obviously wherever you see Homo, um, this is the genus, right? And, and this is the species here. So these are earlier 
species in, in the genus Homo, and these are later. Okay, so if you take a look at this, and, and I will tell you that on the next exam, um, if we're talking, you know, I do ask you questions about the, the human evolution and about some of these species here. I do usually provide you with this so that you have a little bit of a reference point and, 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 and are able to interpret this, okay? Rather than memorizing the sequence here in terms of what uh, species was around earliest versus latest and, and memorizing these names, I, I really don't think that that's necessary, okay? So I think that this is a pretty helpful figure to look at. Um, puts a lot of things in perspective here. So one, it's showing you some, you know, skulls that were found some with from some of these different species. And you can see how they're very different, okay? Also shows you, um, obviously, timing-wise, right? So how many mil million years ago these different groups were around. Uh, okay, so anyway, you can see here, right, these are all the, um, if you go back here, these are all the hominins, right? And then you can see where it starts the genus Homo. Okay, so if we start talking about Artipithecines, okay, so these are human-like hominins, earliest versions. Again, if you go back here, right, we, we mentioned these here, okay? So keep kind of referring back. And so there, we're, we're mentioning two different specific uh, species here, <clears throat> but we can just kind of talk about these artipithecines in, in general, okay? So these are two different um, species that we've identified. So approximately the size of a chimpanzee, so pretty small. They have a pretty small head and brain, um, actually a smaller brain than the chimpanzee. They walked erect, but they still spent most of their time in the trees. All right, and so there was there's this fossil called Ardi, which is a fossil, an artipithecine fossil that was basically reconstructed, and it's a female fossil. Um, and I'll show you a picture. Oh, I guess I don't have a picture of Ardi. I don't have a picture of Artie, but you can, there is a, a, a sort of a famous reconstructed fossil of an artipithecine named Artie. Look it up. This is showing you, um, if you look at the difference between Homo sapiens versus one of these artipithecines, you can see that it's much shorter. See how much smaller the head is. Um, the arms are still really long, right? So yes, they're bipeds, but, um, but not definitely completely evolved to be a biped. I mean, you can also see different sort of um, distance here or, or sort of uh, different structure in the hip girdle and in terms of how the top of the legs sort of line up. All right, so another type of early hominin. Um, no, are we early or late here? So if we go back, right? Now we're talking about a later human-like hominin, right? Australopithecines. Okay, so we talked about some artipithecines in general, and now we're here. Okay, so again, keep flipping back or keep a copy there to keep this in perspective so you know where you're at. And so these guys are be believed to evolve and diversified in Africa about 4 million years ago until about 1.5 million years ago. And so possibly direct ancestor of humans, um, they, they um, display something called mosaic evolution where you basically see that different parts change at different rates at different times, right? So like they have some parts that are more ape-like and some that are more human-like, okay? So small brain, which is ape-like, but they're walking erect, more human-like. And again, obviously you're gonna see more and more changes as you move along. Again, pretty short, right? Larger than the chimpanzee though, larger than the, um, sorry, I didn't mean to change that. Larger than the um, artipithecines, right? A little bit larger. Okay, <clears throat> but still have a pretty small brain. They are believed to consume some meat. They use very, very simple stone tools to scrape meat from bones. All right, so some specific uh, examples of species, right, that we've identified. So in Eastern Africa, I guess the most significant fossil that we found from this group is um, this particular uh, species. So Australopithecus afarensis okay and there is a fossil called lucy that's sort of been that also has been reconstructed and i'll show you a picture i do have a picture of lucy uh so bipedal right human like low forehead large canine teeth still pretty small blank brain and arms are still large uh, longer than the legs um so again this this species is believed to be more directly related to early members of the genus homo 
than the South African species, okay? So apparently this species is believed to be more directly related to um, genus Homo, okay? Uh, as opposed to these guys here. Okay, but these are also species of Australo, Australopithecines, okay? The same thing, small brain, long arms, they climb trees, they have a human, more human-like pelvis. Um, if you look at a picture uh, of, of Lucy, here's a picture of Lucy. Obviously, these were fossils that were found and then reconstructed, and then they obviously added the hair and the skin, you know, um, to make it look more lifelike. All right, now we're moving into the early genus Homo. Again, sorry to flip back, but if you go back here, right? Now we were, we talked about artipithecines, right? We talked about australopithecines, and now we're talking about the early genus Homo, okay? So we're moving along in, in time here. All right, so early, early genus Homo, some species Homo habilis and Homo rodolfensis. Um, Apparently, there's some recent evidence, again, this DNA evidence that may suggest that these are a single species, right? So we identify them as two separate species based on fossil evidence, um, but now that we have more and more information, it looks like they may actually be one species, okay? Um, and so these were the first ones to really to use actual stone tools. So we, I mentioned that before with the Australopithecines that they might have they used sort of stone to scrape off meat off the bones, but I guess those weren't really... Um, sort of well-developed stone tools, okay? These guys were around about two million years ago, maybe ancestral among modern humans. They're more socially organized and they're scavengers. I said they use tools, okay? So if you're thinking about sort of tool use and, and the sort of more of the social aspect, you're gonna see this more in the early genus Homo. Um, again, you're gonna see a larger brain than what we talked about before. The, the teeth and the jaw, will more resemble modern humans as well. And these guys are going to be omnivorous, right? So they're going to consume both meat and plant material. Okay, so these are all things that we haven't really seen in the earlier groups. Okay, <clears throat> so some more species here. So Homo ergaster and Homo erectus. Uh, these guys are, um, our fossils have been found in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And these date between about 1.9 and 0.3 million years ago. So again, larger brain, flatter face than Homo habilis. So again, you can see this sort of continuing evolution to a more larger complex brain. Um, and also that flatter face to allow for um, increased sort of peripheral vision. Okay, these are much taller. Uh, this is, these guys are the, the first hominids um, believed to use fire. Okay, and they stood erect and they ha their gait is believed to be much more, um, you know, uh, resemble, resembles uh, modern humans a lot more than some of these previous groups that we talked about. All right, so this is just showing you a scientist putting together some of these fossils that, was, that were found for Homo ergaster. Um, all right, so again, let's go back to see where we're at, right? We're still, we're still here, right? We talked about Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, okay? And so we're kind of, we're moving on here. Right, so what's in purple here are all the early genus um, Homo, okay? All right, so here is another species that was found. So um, I guess this is sort of a, maybe a newer discovered species, right? So 2004, there was an 18,000 year old fossil that was discovered, okay? Um, it says the brain case is about a third of the size of a modern human. Used tool from fire, um, and it's believed that it, these this species may have evolved from Homo erectus. Okay, so again, I, I'm I'm I, I would think with more and more of this molecular data, we may be discovering that some of the fossils we have may indeed be different species, right? So this is again sort of ever changing. All right, now we're in the later genus Homo. So again, if we go back, right? We're now here. Okay. So we've, we've, we've moved in to getting closer and closer to human or to homo sapiens, okay? So if you're talking about Neanderthals, right, um, these were first discovered in the Germany's Neander Valley and hence why they were named that. The skeleton state back about 200,000 years ago, um, they have these massive brow ridges, protruding nose, jaws, teeth, and they're really heavily muscled. And so um, 
there's a lot of evidence that indicates they were very culturally advanced. Okay, so they constructed shelters, they manufactured tools, they hunted, they used fire, they buried their dead, suggesting that they have some type of, you know, a religion, right? And this sort of social gathering and community, something that we haven't seen before. And so this is really what's going to, you know, set apart uh, the genus Homo from those, those earlier, uh, you know, species that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> now, so Neanderthals are a separate species, right? Okay. If you talk about Cro-Magnum, and you probably have heard about, or you've heard this term before, these are actually designated as Homo sapiens. Okay. Now again, they're going to be, you know, they're still different than the current Homo sapiens, but they're believed to be the same species. Okay. Um, they made advanced stone tools, right? Now we're going to see the development of language. Um, they were hunter-gatherers, right? So they collected food from the environment rather than domesticating animals um, and growing food. They were also really good hunters. And so we talked about, you know, the woolly mammoth and the, the saber-toothed cat, not shouldn't say tiger there, that were around during that Pleistocene epoch, right? And that it's believed that humans, right, or homo sapiens had a um, role in the extinction of these large mammals because they were such good hunters and they were obviously, you know, um, able to sort of outsmart these large animals. So again, just a little bit more on kind of the tool use and the language. Um, <clears throat> again, these are much more sophisticated, sophisticated tools than we talked about in earlier species. So compound tools, knife, knife like blades, it could actually use these tools, or, or you probably want to call them weapons, to kill animals from a distance. I mean, you would imagine they would have to have a pretty um, well-developed, um, you know, knife or, or spear to be able to kill a, a mammoth, right, or a saber-toothed cat. Um, if we, a little bit more on the language, okay, a much more highly developed brain allowed them to perfect language, okay, and so again, they could communicate better, right, they could solve problems, you know, together and so they had a lot more power in terms of of what they could do because of this there are also um, evidence of cave paintings and and these depictions of animals that they did and so um they you can you can tell that they had a much more complex way of thinking also with the cro magnums you also saw this rise of agriculture so we said they were hunters they were gatherers um but they also basically you know farmed and and they 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 could um it's sort of the sort of beginnings of of agriculture um it says full dependency on domestic crops and animals didn't occur until about 4500 years ago but so these guys still hunted and fished and gathered but they also grew their own food as well okay um yeah so once some of their other, you know, food sources weren't available. It's believed that they started to, you know, depend more on agriculture. So again, if if the if if, if they weren't um, or didn't have as as complex of brains as as they did, they wouldn't have been able to probably make that change, right? So because of 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 having that ability, they were able to then um, turn from being more hunter and gatherers, right, to the agriculture because they had to you know find a way to survive and so that larger more complex brain gave them that ability to adapt to that okay all right so this is just showing you some pictures of the cave paintings of the cro magnum again you probably heard of these before um <clears throat> okay if you talk about obviously we know there's much a lot of variation within the human population right and so um, this is just some sort of hypotheses about um, human variation, which probably all makes sense to you. You probably could have came out with these hypotheses themselves, right? Um, that obviously says for skin color, says white skin, I'm sorry, white skin ensures vitamin D production um, when UV intensity is low. And um, dark skin is protective against high UV of bright sunlight, right? And so these are adaptations that have occurred depending on the environment that you know, we live in um, body shape and environmental conditions. Yes, you see this as well, right? So colder regions, animals have bulkier builds in um, 
in colder regions, we also see shorter limbs, digits, and ears. Um, again, will help these will help regulate body temperature because there's not as much um, surface area to volume to basically, uh, or that ratio isn't as high, and so it's easier to, easier to regulate body temperature. All right, and so this is this was showing you kind of this um, difference in sort of colder temperature where you're going to see the shorter stockier build versus a you know a lean taller build in in warmer areas, um, and then obviously showing you variation in the human population, which I'm pretty sure you don't need a picture like that to to know about human uh, variation. Um, this is just to kind of add. This is the last slide here, right? So. Uh, this this is some um, um, sometimes I leave this out altogether, but this is basically hypotheses that are sort of um, have been devised to explain um, human evolution and put together the sort of genetic evidence that has come about. Um, so it says replacement model pertains to the origin of ethnic groups, right? So it's a this this hypothesis hypothesis proposes that all modern humans have a relatively recent common ancestor, right? Cro-Magnon who evolved in Africa and then spread to other regions. And so um, it says variation is less among modern populations than among those older human populations. Um, and so, and there has been a lot of DNA evidence that have showed that there, um, that differences among human populations are consistent with having a common ancestor that wasn't that old, right? That's no more than a million years ago. Um, yeah, and so that, so anyway, there's evidence that serves to support this hypothesis here. I'm not going to ask you about this replacement model and this this um, hypothesis. I, again, I think it just sort of reiterates the point that more and more of this DNA evidence that we obtain is going to change what we believe to sort of be the sequence of events if we talk about evolution um, and, and, and where maybe different species migrated to and then what species from there um, evolved from them. And so the, again, this is ever changing. So I think this also kind of points that you know, Al, I'm not, again, I'm not going to ask you about the replacement model um, or about this Lewontin study. If you're interested in it, you can look it up a little bit more, but this was one particular study that looked at some gene variation um, in geographic groups of current humans and then, um, you know, use that to compare to some of the DNA information we have from those older humans. And then it helped explain the sort of migration patterns of some of these groups. All right. Thank you very much.